Hey, how's it going guys? Today I'm going to be taking you through a tournament game that I played four years ago in 2020 in a place called Doncaster in the UK. So I was 15 years old at the time, hence my low rating. Um, and this round was very significant. It was just the fifth round out of five for the tournament. <clears throat> and in my section, the intermediate section, the winner... Uh, like first place would get like I think it was something like 350 pounds which I mean is a lot for a 15 year old right coming into this round I am on three points out of four with two wins and two draws and my opponent is on three and a half points out of four with three wins and one draw as for the rest of the standings there was like four other players who were also on three points out of four but no one else was on three and a half and no one was on four Meaning that if my opponent wins this game, he wins the tournament. Therefore, I have to beat my opponent in order to overtake him. But it's also likely that even if I overtake him, I'm going to be joint first. Because there's quite a few other players on 3 out of 4 points. Who, if they also win, will end up on 4 out of 4. Which will also be the case if I win. For myself. If you get me. <laughs> but a little bit um, of cool stuff you guys should be able to see this this is uh the guy that i was playing phil ellis uh seemed like a nice guy um i mean i just played him in a game and that was it uh, but this is actually a photo from our game which you can see from the way the pieces are positioned here um which obviously we'll get into now <laughs> so with that said the game opens with c4 and I know I have to win, so I go for a King's Indian. Uh, the King's Indian is kind of a risky opening because, you know, you're playing a hyper-modern system where you're developing from afar to control the center instead of occupying it with pawns, which makes a draw much less likely and makes either white be more likely to win through their space advantage and a potential queenside attack or black win through a pawn storm on the king side and some kind of attack through that, right? So a, a draw is kind of less likely in this opening, which is why I play it, because I need to win as black. So my opponent's principled, he just puts three pawns in the center, and here I have to go d6 so that e5 can't be played to kick my knight. Knight f3, castle, h3, which I think was quite a trendy line at the time. I go e5. And this looks like I'm giving up a pawn. But after takes, takes. Queen takes. Rook takes. Knight takes. The classic knight takes e4 tactic is played. Where his knight's hanging. And I'm attacking this knight as well. And I've also won the pawn back on e4. And this is just slightly better for black because I'm already castled, but it's essentially a draw and end game. So my opponent doesn't go into that because he also needs to win, right? We both need to win this game because if he draws and ends up on four points out of five, it's likely that some of the other players on three points out of four are going to win and tie him for first. So he needs to win and I need to win. So he plays d5 instead, locking up the center and... You know, his typically the idea is for white to get c5 in to undermine my pawn structure, and black's plan is to go f5 to undermine white's pawn structure and start an attack on the king side. So knight d7, well, knight b to d7, just developing, bishop d3, and I go knight c5, attacking the bishop. So the bishop drops back, and I play a5, so that b4 can't be played to kick my knight out because I'm controlling the square. This is a very typical setup in the King's Indian, because the c5 knight is quite strong. My opponent castles, I go knight e8, which is quite typical. You're preparing to go f5, and your knight's just getting out of the way. My opponent plays bishop to g5, attacking my queen, because my knight's moved. So I go f6 to kick it out, the bishop goes to h4, I might be able to do this um, if I want to 
be really insistent on playing f5. But that doesn't happen. My opponent drops back to attack my knight. And here, if I play a move like f5, then my opponent could damage my structure like this. And this means that my e5 pawn loses a lot of support. And I don't want this. So I go b6, which the computer doesn't like. But the idea is bishop takes, and I can take with the b pawn, which keeps my d pawn stable and allows me to have better control over e5 than if my d pawn had to take, because this f pawn is going to advance. Uh, so he, he doesn't take. Uh, he goes queen to d2, which sets up a battery on this diagonal to try and trade off my dark squared bishop, which is a really important defender of my king, especially since I'm going to be throwing all these pawns forward, which I proceed to do with f5. If my opponent takes the pawn, I'm going to take back, and my pawns are going to start rolling in the center and kicking his minor pieces around as they advance. And then it opens up space for my other pieces to get involved into the action once these pawns have moved forward and kind of grabbed the space so that my pieces can situate themselves behind the pawns, right? It provides like a layer of protection, essentially. So he doesn't take any of his bishop g5 again, attacking my queen. Here I can move my queen to d7 to get out of the attack, but I don't really like that because it blocks my bishop in. Even though I could probably rotate it to f7, but I decide against that and I instead go bishop to f6. And I'm inviting white to take on f6, where I'll probably take with the knight to put lots of pressure on this pawn. And if my opponent takes me, then I'm going to take back. And if my opponent defends the pawn with something like rookie one, I could take, but I could also maybe play f4 and lock the structure so that my bishop opens up. And like I said before, once I've grabbed the space, my pieces can start to situate themselves behind the pawn wall because white's going to struggle to transfer pieces to the king side now. My opponent doesn't accept the trade and he goes bishop to h6, which attacks my rook. I could block it, but I instead go for rook f7. And what follows, I had calculated already. e takes f5, g takes f5, and knight to g5, which attacks the rook. Now if I take this knight, then the bishop takes, and I've lost the key defender of my dark squares, and my opponent still has his dark squared bishop. In the previous position, here, I was happy to trade bishops, because whilst it weakens the dark squares, my opponent doesn't have a dark squared bishop to actually exploit them with. Whereas here, if I take take, my opponent does have a dark squared bishop to exploit the weak dark squares. So instead I go rook to g7, sacrificing the rook, because if bishop takes g7, I have bishop takes g5 into mezzo, which comes with an attack on the queen. And if the queen moves, then I just pick the bishop up and I have two pieces for a rook, which is winning. My opponent would have to find f4, attacking the bishop. So if I take the bishop, he takes my bishop. I have to go bishop takes, attacking the queen. Rook takes. And then I'd probably have to take the bishop rather than the rook. Um, I suppose if I take the rook... My dark squares are just way too weak. I don't think I saw all of this at the time. I was rated 1500 at the time. I think I just saw this queen move and take the bishop. And I think my opponent also only saw that because he played knight to e6 instead. Which means that the bishop is now free to take the rook because I have no bishop takes knight. And here I take the knight again, if the bishop takes the rook, then I can play knight takes bishop, so it's no longer under attack, and I have two pieces for a rook, and I'm completely winning. So instead he takes the knight, and here I was a, a bit of a loss, because if I move my rook, well, firstly, where do I move it? If I move it to g6... Bishop takes f5, because my bishop's defense has been, has been cut off by the pawn appearing on e6. 
and I'm losing. If I move my rook to somewhere like e7 again, bishop takes f5, and this pawn is a big problem, especially with queen to d5 coming, or maybe knight to d5, or knight to b5, my position is very, very lost. So, I was happy to give up the rook. Bishop takes e6, sacrificing the rook, because I get an extra pawn, white loses an important central pawn, and I can start getting my pawns rolling. So he takes the rook, I take with the bishop. I take with the bishop rather than knight, because I want my knight to come to f6 um, once my queen comes out to help with the attack. And so here, I'm down an exchange, but I have an extra pawn. And these pawns are strong. I also have the bishop pair. My opponent has no dark square bishop, so the dark squares could be weak. And I want to move my king, maybe get my rook involved, and just really try to go after his king side. So knight d5 is played. Just centralizing the knight. Obviously, I can't take, because... I mean, I'm going to lose any chance for attack that I have. If you're down material, you can't go trading material. You need to keep as many pieces on the board as you can to create as many attacking possibilities as you can. So I go c6, attacking the knight. This does soften up the d6 pawn a bit, but my knight does keep an eye on the pawn for now, and I'm probably hoping to advance to d5 at some point. He goes to e3. I go f4 which just gains a tempo and tries to cut off some defensive lines for my opponent whilst also opening up some attacking ones for myself. He goes knight f5, and for the same reason as we discussed, I can't really take this. Now, he is attacking my bishop. If I move my bishop, I was worried that I was wasting too much time. So instead I go queen to g5, which attacks the knight and asks him, yo, do you want to take my bishop? You know, because I'm hoping this is going to waste too much time for him. This pawn is hanging, and it will come with an attack on the rook. If this knight moves somewhere, then I can take on h3, because the pawn's pinned. So it's not an easy position at all for my opponent to play. My opponent also can't take on d6, really, because of ideas like rook to d8. Oh my god. Rook to d8, pinning the knight, and the fact that it opens up my bishop. So he goes queen to d3. Just defending the knight, also lending support to the h3 pawn, and lending support to the c4 pawn. So it was a very nice move. I play knight f6, with the idea of getting my knight into the game. Which does kind of hang this pawn... But my idea was if knight takes, I'm going to play rook to d8. And my opponent must have thought the same thing. right? I think at this point we must have been pretty low on time. I don't have any um, timings on my score sheet. But you, you would assume we're quite low on time. Also a little bit of fun context is that um, since I was 15, I was at the place with my mum. So big props to mother. For, um, for coming with me and she knows nothing about chess right like she has no clue so she also didn't want to come into the playing hall because she thought that she might put me off or distract me so she was kind of just standing out in the corridor to the playing hall and at this point there was loads of people gathered around my board there was like 10 to 20 people all watching because this was the big game for our section. If my opponent wins, he wins the whole thing. If I win, then I'm tied for first, and my opponent is second. So, <laughs> there was, there was um, a few people that I'd uh, spoken to earlier on in the tournament, like older guys, and they kept on going like to the board and back to the corridor to tell my mum how, how I was getting on, and that I'd... Like, I was taking a big risk, uh, giving up material for an attack. Um, that was kind of some fun context. But basically, there was so much pressure on both of us, because there were so many people gathered around watching, right? And that's one of the parts of over-the-board chess that is very different from online chess. Because if you lose an online game, it doesn't matter. 
if you lose an over the board game you know you might have like maybe not 10 20 people but people are watching and it affects the results and you're talking about it afterwards with everyone or, or with your opponent right so it's a much much more like high pressure situation and my opponent takes on g7 reflecting how how high of a pressure situation it is because he just blunders i take with the king and if my opponent takes the pawn on d6 i'm going to take on h3 so he goes king to h2 because this pawn's no longer pinned which is a mistake the computer wants rook to g8 setting up a battery and i instead play d5 because i really don't want to lose this pawn and my idea is after takes is to take with the bishop now the computer wanted me to take with the pawn but i take with the bishop just to put more pressure on my opponent set up ideas of bishop here uh, set up ideas of e4 f3 or maybe f3 straight away uh, in my head my bishop was doing a much better job on this diagonal than on this diagonal so the computer will call it mistake it will also give plus one Sorry, my headphones just turned off for some reason, but it should be working fine again now. Um, yeah, the computer gives like plus 1.6 there and then plus 0.6 there, so let's not worry about it too much, right? My opponent goes rook to g1, which is logical, it defends the pawn, and the computer absolutely hates it. It wants pawn to f3, but after pawn f3, these dart squares are so weak. I can maybe bring my knight in. I can just give a check which looks really dangerous i can potentially do something like this and try to go after the h3 pawn f3 is a tough move to make so he goes rook to g1 instead just defending it and keeping his pawn structure intact i go queen h4 attacking here pinning this pawn to set up ideas of knight takes of knight to g4 check to win this pawn because if my opponent plays something like this then I win the queen. So it's a tricky it's a tricky move, queen h4, which is why I play it. And my opponent goes queen to f5, which controls the g4 square enough times so that knight here is no longer possible. And it attacks the 5 pawn. But here I take on f2. And again, the rook can't move because of the threat of mate. And whilst it looks kind of scary for my king after something like queen here, my king is actually really safe on f7. And then my rook's going to come into the game and my opponent is going to lose. Yeah, there's some ideas of um, this. Um, well, you can just take on g2, but just imagine a position. Okay, let's... Let's just imagine a position where I can play knight g4 and then mate him like this. There's also these ideas. So it's a really tough position, but my opponent goes rook a to e1, which is a good move. Gets the rook into the game and because it's just sitting on a1, right? He is up in exchange. Even if he is down two pawns, he's got a rook for a minor piece. So he needs to get his rooks into the game. I go queen g3 check, king h1. The reason I do this is because this pawn is now pinned and is not actually defending h3. So this queen needs to keep an eye on h3, otherwise queen takes h3 as mate because of the pin. I go rook e8, which defends the pawn. And my opponent can't take it because when I take back, the queen has to step off of this diagonal and this is mate. A really tough position and in low time my opponent took the pawn so i just took back my opponent took and queen takes h3 was mate and when i played queen takes h3 remember this is an over the board game with like 20 odd people watching at this point um my opponent looked at the board as i i i, I stopped the clock right because it was checkmate and it took him like 10 seconds to actually realize what had happened. 
he must have missed that this pawn was pinned somehow. And, you know, he's, he was very gracious afterwards. Um, but it was really funny because he just didn't realize that it was actually checkmate. He must have thought I was somehow sacrificing my queen. But yeah, I won. And let's see if you guys can see this. Yes, you can. This meant that I came joint first in the tournament with these two guys. Um, and well, I, I, I think I actually came third because of the tie breaks. Although I'm pretty sure we split the first place prize. Or did we split? Ah, yeah. No, what happened is first, second and third place prizes just got totaled up and then split equally between us. That's what happened. That's where the 350 quid came from. It was something like that. I think it was like 200 for first place, 100 for second place and 50 quid for third place. So I think that all got joined together and then split between the three of us. So I got like over 100 quid for this tournament, which was pretty good for me <laughs> as, as you know, a 15 year old. Um, and I think I put that towards a chess.com membership, if I remember correctly. But yeah, that's the game. Hope you guys enjoyed. Um, please stick around for more videos, which we'll be releasing daily. Um, if you enjoyed, please drop a like and subscribe and comment if there's any kinds of videos that you'd like to see more of or less of as well. But with that, have a good one, guys.